Robin, you mentioned the Combahee River Collective, and of course, Barbara, you were part of that collective, and that is kind of the origin of the very misunderstood, often misunderstood, often um, weaponized, often obscured term identity politics. Can you talk about the Combahee River Collective and what identity politics means to you and your cohort? Go ahead, Robin. <laughs> oh, oh, no, I can't. <laughs> this is a question for you. Yeah, I mean, one may have your name know, all over. Rob, Robin has a good understanding of this, uh, though. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I could that? say, well, I could say what I mean. You know, of course, and we all learn this from you. I mean, this is this is a very important question because of the way in which identity politics has been kind of hijacked and transformed. And what happens is that people, including people on the left, will criticize the hijacked version and not actually go to the source. So if you look at the uh, Combahee River, River Collective, um, you know, it, it lays out what the is statement. a radical. Yeah, the, the statement lays out what is really a truly radical understanding of identity. Identity is not mentioned in terms of narrow interests, uh, but it is really about a critique of what what the statement calls interlocking uh, uh, oppressions. You know, the fact that um, that to identify as a black woman or as a queer black woman is to recognize the multiple vectors of oppression and extraction that they have to experience. And there's so many movements that emerged that said, you know, that's not really important. Well, we'll we, ha we have to deal with, with, with racism in the man. Or we have to deal with capitalism, you know, and all this other stuff is secondary. And trust me, after the revolution, racism would just disappear, you know, and that's not people's realities. And I just want to just point out to people this really important paragraph, and I could read the whole thing, where the statement states that, you know, we're socialists, right? Um, they talk about material resources must be equally distributed among those who create these resources, you know. And we are not convinced, however, that a socialist revolution that is not also a feminist and anti-racist revolution will guarantee our liberation. It was a gauntlet-throwing statement for all movements of liberation to embrace. It wasn't exclusionary, right? And that's what identity politics was intended to mean. It wasn't corporate diversity politics. It wasn't representation within a multiracial ruling class. On the contrary. What we see on the streets is a multiracial, multiracial opposition to a multiracial ruling class, which is class struggle, but we don't ever see it that way. We often see that as, you know, not the real class struggle, because the people who talk about the real class struggle are the armchair, armchair leftists who don't actually do much, but criticize every other movement for not putting class first. It definitely has been hijacked. And one of the things that's really important to understand about the place and time of origin is what was going on around gender uh, and sexuality and race and class politics at the time. What we were asserting is that we, as people identified as uh, black and female at birth, and who were also, uh, who were, you know, a part of you know, those two uh, groups, that we had a right to form our own political agendas. And this was not a perspective that was widely shared or supported during the uh, 1970s and into the well, late 1970s and into the uh, early 1980s, because black politics and black struggle was understood to be black male defined and struggle around gender and, and also to some extent sexuality was considered to be white and white women. So we were saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's something going on here in our lives that has not been captured at all and certainly has not developed into a, uh, a visible political agenda. And we're saying we have a right to actually begin to be involved in that project. We were not separatists. We strongly believe in coalition. And we did not sell, see ourselves as superior to any other group of people. And one of the things about our believing in coalition is that we have a record of practice. You know, we, it's not just in the book that we say, or in the statement that we say that we're committed to that. We're committed to this uh, day. One of the things that I've been working on a lot this year is the situation in Ukraine. 
Yes, I said the situation in Ukraine. Why would I, as a black woman and an out black lesbian, be concerned about that? Because it's a problem. That's why. And it's a problem that's susceptible to political dialogue and to political intervention. So, I mean, as I said, we don't have to prove that we're committed to it. We have the record of it. And one of the things about how it has been misunderstood is that most people have never read the Combahee River Collective Statement. They have no idea that those two words together, identity politics, first appeared there. I believe that the way that it has been misunderstood and misinterpreted is because other people came up with the same concept, that people on the right and, and the left started using the concept according to what their definitions were without ever knowing that there was like a first uh, iteration of that in something written by black feminists. So I, I don't want to be blamed. That's one of the things I, I came on your show to say, do not blame me <laughs> for right. what has happened to identity politics because people have not read the original source. And if they did, they might feel a little more comfortable around what it was we were saying. Do you remember discussions about this? Like, was there an aha moment with someone like, oh, it's identity. Let's use this word. Was it more organic? How did it come out? Well, there, there's some like, there's like a secret history of uh, the writing <laughs> of the Combahee River Collective Statement. And I will probably not share it here, oh, but there man. were only three of us. I'll say this. There are only three okay. of us. Okay. So this is the process. The process is that my sister Beverly, my twin sister Beverly and I, and Demeter Fraser, we got together, we taped a conversation or maybe more than one conversation and then a certain person namely me was charged with going home and typing up what we had said so i'm not sure that if identity politics was something that we had said mm. as a group because that's lost to time sadly or if it was something that i just typed on my little smith corona uh, right. portable typewriter yeah that's what we used in those days yeah but be that as it may um I can't say, I can't say. Certainly the concept of identity politics evolved in the context of the Combahee River Collective among more people than just the three who I mentioned who took on the task of writing it. But as far as like, did we ever say those words and then you know, I write them down or somebody say, oh, you need to put that in because we came back after I'd done a draft and um, suggestions were made and then back to the drawing board until we had it finished. But as I said, I can't say that de definitively. I just know it was a concept that was applicable to what we had been discussing politically. Mm. Right. So, so Barbara, can I ask you a question about this? So is it, it's true that um, Zilla Eisenstein had wanted you all to create a, uh, a statement for a feminist conference at uh, Antioch. Is that right? No, no, no. This, no, she asked us to write something for her book capitalist patriarchy and the case for socialist feminism right. uh that uh conference at antioch which i attended that socialist mm -hmm. feminist conference at antioch uh, which i think would have been the summer of 75 mm -hmm. um uh, the the comedy river collective statement followed that chronologically so yes zila at uh, eisenstein she didn't say write a statement as I recollect, I think she just asked, can you write something? Can the collector write something for this book? And the statement is what we came up with. And I also say, quite honestly, I don't know that we ever would have written the statement if Zila had not asked us to. Hmm. Right. Because why would we have? But the challenge of getting it down on paper, that was a great coming together of uh, circumstances that we did do it. Right. See, that's so important because it then you know, demonstrates again what it means to be in coalition, what it means to be part of a larger movement. And also, and I just want to just hold this up. All of you were involved in really significant struggles around reproductive rights, around um, anti-war uh, and anti-war movement, of course, and coming out of the civil rights movement, but even immediately in Boston. Uh, the violence against, uh, vicious violence against uh, women, Black women in particular, vulnerable women, uh, creating battered shelters, uh, uh, shelters for battered women, um, you know, doing th this work, fighting even on the tail end of Roe, the, these struggles around Black women's right to not be sterilized. You know, exactly. Um, and you're doing that really important work. And I think those politics are part of what shapes the radical character 
of the statement. You know, that's true. And that's, that's what I was saying about our practice, that we have a record of practice. And you, I know that you mentioned in your interview with Kianga Yamada Taylor, you talk about how um, you would per, you would attend uh, strikes, uh, picket lines, uh, protests for uh, construction workers who were surprised to see you show up. So how did you, how did that occur to you? Was that an organic part of your politics? Did you think of it, oh, we should be doing this? Or was it just part of your view of the world? Because we were so politically active and because at that time, uh, Boston had a really interesting left, uh, you know, leftist movement that was working on a number of issues, we would hear about most things that would have been relevant to people with our politics. Another thing that was going on in Boston at that time was uh, the, the uh, war, I don't know what else to call it, around school desegregation. So uh, at the very same time that Kambahi was beginning its work and doing its work, there was race war going on in the city where we were trying to do it. And uh, the, the fact is that that uh, picket line that we described was on the site of a new high school that was being built in Roxbury, which is the central black community, or at least at the time was a central black community in Boston, but they weren't hiring any people of color to work on the high school in the black that was cited in the black community. So that's why we came out for that because it was a clear, you know, workers' rights and racial rights issue. Right. And that's very typical, of course, of the construction, the history of the construction trades in the United States that uh, no people of color need apply. So that was why.